a very, very uh, warm welcome um, to you all and back to this, our second of six lessons uh, on space and time. And it really is great to have you back. I'm glad you enjoyed it last week. Now, last yeah. week, last time we left Earth on the first leg of our journey across the universe. So this week, we're going to take a look at the planets and, and assorted objects that orbit our sun in the immense region that we call the solar system. Okay, so there we go. So the question is, what is the solar system? What exactly is it? Well, if you look up at the sky, oh, here comes Alicia. Good afternoon to you. Nice to see you. Uh, okay, where were we? Yeah, the solar system. So um, if you look up on a, a clear night, um, you can see one of the most wondrous things you can possibly see in the entire universe which is the universe and it's full of all sorts of objects that you can see out there um, and in the solar system itself that's all the stuff that's really close to us and when I say really close it's still millions of miles away compared to the, the size of the universe which we'll find out later it's practically in the back garden but we'll, we'll get there anyway so the sort of thing you can find in the solar system well we have um, oops somebody's got their mic on so that one is, uh, that's it I'm just gonna mute you can unmute yourself if you want to speak um, yeah there we go. let's put it back on the so there's and there are so many different things uh, that you can see in the solar system uh, and there's so many things in the universe you look up on a night sky and you can see all these things you can see stars planets moons dwarf planets comets all sorts of amazing things out there uh, asteroids uh, dust clouds gas and in terms of the numbers of each of these objects well as far as we know so far in our solar solar system there's one star there are eight planets venus earth mars jupiter saturn uranus and neptune there are five dwarf planets uh, pluto ceres halma Makamaki and Eris, 181 moons, uh, 5, 000, no, 566,000 asteroids and 3,100 comets. So oops, that's a little map, if you like, or a, a scheme of what the solar system is made of. That's not to scale. Everything's spread out a lot more than that, but it's such a distance. If I was to put the sun, the size that it is on that screen there, then Mercury will be completely the other side of this village, probably the other side of the town. Um, and I couldn't fit it onto the screen. So it's all squashed down in there, but there you have it. There's the planets, the inner planets, the asteroid belts, the outer planets. We'll talk about each of these in turn as we go on. We've got comets in there. We've got um, and something called the Kuiper belt, which we'll come on to towards the end of this lesson. So, yeah, all good stuff to come. So to know exactly what we mean when we say solar system, it's important to break it down into what those two words mean. And that is solar, the first word, which simply means of the sun. And secondly, a system is just a word for a collection of objects that interact with each other to form a whole. So you put the two words together and you get the following definition. Okay, the solar system is a group of objects that interact with one another and the fundamental interaction for each object being the one it has with the sun. In other words, the solar system is the sun and everything that's in its gravitational influence that's orbiting around it. That's what it is. Okay, so let's have a look at some of the things that we can find in this solar system. Well, the first thing is the comets. I, I started with comets because these are quite interesting things. Comet is, is, a, is a, an object. It's a, it's a lump of rock. Um, and it it flies around the universe. Um, I say the universe, it flies around the solar system and it's frozen rock. It's traveling around the sun and it follows incredibly long elliptical orbits and the orbits take them far away from the sun and they're only actually visible when they return near to the sun and they start to heat up and they heat up so much they emit light and bits fly off and they have a long tail coming away from the sun. Okay, so some more things about the solar system. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> the solar system itself is 4.6 billion years old. That's old. There are eight planets, as we mentioned, five dwarf planets, 180 
one moons. There we go. Five, uh, 552,894 asteroids, if you're going to be uh, precise. And 3,083 of these comets. That's 3,083 things that take years, decades to go around the, the, the sun. Um, Halley's Comet, which you may have heard of, a very famous one, pretty much the first one and the only one everyone really knows uh, by name. Um, that comes around every 76 years. It came around a little a few years ago, long before you were born, so you'll probably see it again. Um, I probably won't because um, I'll be very, 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 very old or uh, I would have left the planet permanently by then. But there you go. Um, the solar system size, it's 18.75 trillion kilometers. That's 11.65 trillion miles trillion miles and that's how as i said at the beginning that's our neighborhood okay so there are some other little things that you might see from time to time if you look roughly northeast on a night uh, at the moment a nice clear night which we're getting plenty of you might be able to see a meteor shower uh, now meteors are sometimes called shooting stars and they're small bits of rock that burn up when they enter the the earth's atmosphere the friction of the atmosphere at the incredible speed that they're moving at heats up so much that they show us bright streaks of light in the sky. Just a few fractions a second or two, and you can see them. The fascinating things. I would say go out there and there's a picture on the screen there of what they look like. But that literally that streak can last a second or two before it's gone, before the rock's burnt up. you will be amazed at the stuff that so we think of space as a vacuum but there's all sorts of stuff out there that's flying around and it's it's really quite um, a busy place really considering so the solar system also includes uh asteroids as well now the asteroids um are sort of rocks and stuff that um they, they include um minor or dwarf planets uh, as well and they can be up to hundreds of kilometers in in size and they're actually all located in a sort of a belt around the sun mostly between the orbits of mars and jupiter now where did all that stuff come from where are all these rocks from well it's <laughs> is it all orbiting an average star on the outer edges of the galaxy called the milky way it's all this stuff that's there so how did it all come from but anyway we'll go there so uh, yeah, vast galaxy in the Milky Way. Um, we're going to find out what we mean by all of that as we go forward. But um, and also, why is most of the space named after chocolate bars? Well, yeah. answer all those questions. Well, possibly not the one about the chocolate bars. We've got to travel back in time to the birth of the Sun. Okay, so how did the solar system form? Well, first of all, there would have been uh, dust. Remember, I said there's all this stuff. Uh, that's flying around in space. Well, it tends to lump together. It's pulled together by gravity. And sometimes the dust over millions of years gets more and more dense and it attracts more dust and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So we get a dust cloud and that dust cloud gets formed by all that dust being pulled together. And we're not just talking about a little tiny bit of gas. We're talking about billions and billions of tons of gas in fact. And the gravitational attraction pulls those together um, and their own gravitational attraction then pulls other particles and the clouds merge. And eventually you get um, this protostar forming in the middle. It's essentially the, where the dust is squashed so much to pieces. And most of that dust, a lot of that dust is hydrogen. Hydrogen is the simplest element in the, in the universe and it gets put under so much pressure it starts to heat up and it gets squashed so much, not like squashing a, a jelly baby or, or crushing a biscuit, it actually pushes the atoms themselves together and it merges the protons together and the neutrons and it turns hydrogen into helium, the next element and that's the clever bit. Okay, so the sun's heat Oh, here we go. Done the little slide there. You've got nuclear fusion. This is what's happening inside the sun. It's what's happening now. So what happens is you get hydrogen, two different types of hydrogen, and they get squashed together. See what I mean? The, the actual nucleus of the atoms are pushed together, and they form a new element, helium, and they release a neutron, and the process goes over and over and over again, on and on. And every time it does it, it releases a tiny little bit of element of energy. Now inside the sun, there's so much hydrogen being converted into helium. This fusion bubble fusing the two together, that it releases so much heat overall that it produces the heat the sun produces. That's enough to power everything on this planet, essentially. All of our energy 
basically comes from the sun because even fossil fuels that we, we've dug up that have been buried for millions of years, they got their energy when they were alive as plants and animals before they died. And they took the energy from eating other plants and the plants got their energy from the sun. So the sun provides so much energy. It, it, it heats up the atmosphere, causes winds. Um, it, it makes water evaporate and then it condenses again. And that's how rivers and streams that we use for hydroelectric power. So the sun really is, is what makes life happen on the planet. So the sun at the center there, um, its heat would evaporate all the ice and drives the gas away from the inner solar system and it leaves the rocks behind and as the protostar becomes denser the particles speed it up more they collide more so its temperature increases even more and it gets hotter and hotter and hotter and the process transfers energy from the protostar's gravitational energy to its thermal energy store okay go and if it becomes hot enough of course as we say, you get that fusion going on and all the energy being released. <coughs> Excuse me again. <coughs> so we now have a star that's been born and the solar system. Now objects can form that are too small to become stars. Can, these kinds of objects can be attracted by a protostar and they become the planets. They become the planets that are orbiting the star. So everything that wasn't sucked in at that beginning bit to form the sun, the rocks, the heavier bits and pieces that were there, they're the ones that come together, merge and form the planets. The inner ones being quite rocky and the outer ones being gas. So stars like the sun, as we say, they radiate energy. Now, what about the planets? Well, first of all, what is a planet? Well, it's an old Greek word. It means wanderer. Now, it's a highly controversial one. Now, it's not always been the case, though. In fact, before 1978, the definition of planet was not really necessary. Until that time, a planet simply meant something that was in orbit, a body in orbit around the sun, and one that reflected sunlight uh, was not a planetary moon an asteroid or a comet. However, with the discovery of Pluto's moon Charon in 1978, scientists were able to calculate the Pluto's mass much more accurately. And they managed to calculate its mass more accurately than it ever was before. And they soon realized that it was actually much smaller than was previously believed. A tiny fraction of the mass of Mercury, Pluto was clearly a body much smaller than any other planet. And this discovery led to some questions whether Pluto was actually a planet or some other type of object. Now, in the early 1990s and early 2000s, the discovery of loads more objects in the outer solar system, similar in size to Pluto, made it all but necessary to come to a definitive definition of a planet. Such a definition was needed to separate those types of object like Pluto into a distinct class. Otherwise, all of the new found objects would have to be called planets as well. So in response to this uncertainty, a group of people called the International Astronomical Union, the IAU, the official governing body for matters concerning naming uh, astronomical objects, came to a definition of the term planet. So according to the IAU, a planet is a celestial body that meets the following criteria. It has to orbit the sun not something else. It has to have sufficient mass for its self-gravity, its own gravitational field to overcome rigid body forces so that it assumes a hydrostatic equilibrium. What does that mean? It's got to be round, okay? Essentially, not just a lumpy bit of rock. It's got to be planetary. It's got to be round. It's got to be going around the sun. And it has to have cleared the neighborhood around its orbit. So it has to be in its own orbit. So it can't be like a mass of rocks all together. Otherwise, it's not a planet. And finally, oh, sorry, I'd say finally, how many planets then are there in the solar system? Well, according to the IAU's definition for a planet above, there are eight known planets in the solar system. And they are Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. So Pluto, of course, no longer considered a planet by the IAU definition. It was relegated to being a dwarf planet which is quite sad 
So are there any other undiscovered planets in the solar system? Well, there have been several additional planets uh, thought about throughout history, but none of them have ever been found. The most recent uh, that was theorized uh, called Planet X. It's a supposedly giant planet to explain the deviations from predicted orbits of Uranus and Neptune. The maths say there, there should be something there, but it's never been discovered, it's never been found, and science is still unable to explain the, the if we call like it, the, the orbits of Uranus and Neptune. They're wrong. <laughs> uh, and there's not an explanation as to why they're not following the, the, the orbit that they should do, according to the science, according to our understanding now. Um, nevertheless, the scientific community has unanimously come to the conclusion that planet X doesn't actually exist. Um, it's highly unlikely that there are any planets beyond the orbit of Pluto now. Okay, some facts about planets. Now our solar system, as we said, has eight planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And with the exception of Uranus and Neptune, each of these planets can be seen unaided. All eight planets can be seen through the use of an inexpensive uh, amateur telescope or a good pair of binoculars. Okay, so the order they go out from the sun, as we said there, and these are uh, the relative sizes. So the third planet along from the left, that's the Earth, the sort of bluey colored one. Um, that's, if the Earth was that size, the other planets would be this size in scale. So as you can see, they range in size from Mercury to Jupiter, okay? Now, some of those planets are rocky and some of them are gaseous. And we'll find out why and what, which is which in a second. Okay, so here are some uh, distances for you. You don't have to worry about writing these. Now. You can easily look these up and, 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 and it gives you an idea of, of uh, how big they are to each other and how far they're up. So Mercury is the nearest to the sun. First of all, we need to explain something. That AU on that astronomical unit. That's the average distance the Earth is from the Sun at any given time. Okay, sometimes it's a little bit further away, sometimes it's nearer, but we say the distance from the Earth to the Sun is one astronomical unit. So you can tell by looking at the others how far or how near the Sun those are. So for instance, Mercury is 0.387 astronomical units. So that's about 38% nearer the, um, the Sun. So if we're one astronomical unit away, then you're looking at about just over a third, just under a point, let's say 0.4 um, of, of the distance. So 40% of the distance. Venus, 0.7. Earth, of course, is one astronomical unit. Mars is about an astronomical unit and a half away. So the distance from the sun to Earth, half again, that's where you'll find Mars. Just over five times from the sun, Jupiter, nearly 10 times distance of the Earth from the Sun is Saturn, nearly 20 for Uranus, 30 times the distance from the Earth to the Sun to Neptune, and Pluto, the dwarf planet, is just under 40 times the distance from the Sun that the Earth is from the Sun. Incredible distances, really. So let's have a little look at some of these planets themselves. Now, the first one, the nearest the sun, is Mercury. Uh, Mercury is a, a, a really weird, strange place. The temperatures there vary um, quite, um, quite uh, varied, uh, very, very cold to the very, very hot there. So let's just advance the uh, words on my screen because I've gone behind. I've started talking and getting so enthusiastic, I've left my screen behind. Okay, so there are two types of planet, rocky ones and gas ones, as I say. Now, Mercury. So every seven years or so, Mercury can be seen from Earth. By it passes across the face of the sun, a little black dot. And this happens because Mercury's orbit is inclined by seven degrees to the plane of the Earth. It's slightly up, okay? Um, and it's known as a transit. Um, now, I know it said it's seven years, but the... The next transit of Mercury is going to be November the 12th, the 13th in 2032. So it's slightly longer this time. So let's have a look at Earth versus Mercury. Now that's the relative size of the planets. Now Mercury, um, a year, i.e. the number of times it takes you to go around the sun, 
on Mercury is 88 days. So a Mercurian year is 88 days. And, but it turns very slowly because a day on Mercury is 176 Earth days. So it's about twice the length of the year to go around in a, what you would call a day. So that's weird for a start. Okay, it's very nearly tidally locked to the sun. It's also known as gravitational lock. Now what this means, over time, this has slowed the rotation of the planet to almost match its orbit around the sun. A bit like the moon going around the Earth. It's that close and that much under the influence of the gravitational field. It's actually slowing its spinning round. So eventually it will stop and there'll be one side facing the sun all the time, a bit like the moon. You only get one side facing the Earth. Now, Mercury is the smallest planet in the solar system. It's got a diameter of about 4,879 kilometers. It's one of five planets that is visible to the naked eye. It's only the second hottest planet, though. Venus, although a lot further from the sun than Mercury, actually experiences higher temperatures. And that's because Mercury has no atmosphere to regulate temperature and it results in the most extreme temperature change of all the planets. It ranges from minus 170 centigrade during the night to plus 430 centigrade during the day. So, yeah, pretty much an extreme. Okay, Venus then, the next one out. Venus, beautiful planet. Um, Venus, again, the second planet from the sun. The third brightest object in Earth's sky after the sun and moon. And at night time, it's the se obviously the second brightest. And at the moment, it's really bright. So if you go out in the early in the evening, um, you look to the west on a clear night and you see a very, what looks like a very, very bright star. That's Venus. And if you've got a good telescope, you can actually look at Venus and see the shape of it. But you need a really good telescope for that. Now, it's sometimes referred to as the sister planet to Earth. That's because their size and mass are very similar. And Venus is also the closest planet to Earth. Now, the surface of Venus is hidden by an opaque layer of cloud. And that's formed. Those clouds are made of sulfuric acid. Remember that? Imagine that sulfuric acid clouds. When it rains on Venus, it rains acid. Now, the planet is named for Venus, the Roman goddess of love. As I say, it's the second largest terrestrial planet. Here we go. You can see that compared to the Earth, Venus is only just marginally smaller than the Earth. So it's the second brightest natural object in the night sky. It has a pretty good magnitude. It's, it's visible on a bright, clear day. So if it's in the sky and the sun's still up, you can, if it's in the right direction, not in the same direction as the sun, you can actually see it in the daytime if you know where to look. It's sometimes referred to as the morning star, and also the evening star. Now that goes back to ancient civilizations. They believed that Venus was in fact two different stars and they appeared in the sky. So when the orbit of Venus overtakes Earth's orbit, it changes from being visible at sunrise to being visible at sunset. Now one day on Venus is longer than one year due to the slow rotation of its axis. It takes 200 143 Earth days to complete one rotation. The orbit of the planet takes 225 Earth days, making a year on Venus shorter than a day on Venus. It's got about 81% of Earth's mass and they're similarly located. Venus is closer to the Sun than um, Earth, obviously, and both planets have a central core. They have a molten mantle and a crust. Now, billions of years ago, the climate on Venus may have been very similar to that on Earth. And scientists believe that Venus once possessed large amounts of water or even oceans. However, due to the high temperatures produced from the extreme greenhouse effect, all this water boiled off long ago and the surface of the planet is now too hot and hostile to sustain life. So Venus rotates in the opposite direction to other planets as well. So the sun rises in the west and sets in the east there. Don't know why, but it just does. Um, but Venus, like Uranus, rotates clockwise. These are known as retrograde rotations and may have been caused by a collision with an asteroid or another object which caused the planet to change on its rotational path. We don't really know. Venus, as we said, is the hottest planet in the solar system. It's got an average surface temperature of 462 degrees centigrade, 863 Fahrenheit. Also, Venus doesn't tilt on its axis. 
and it means that there are no seasons. There's no summer, winter, spring, or autumn on Venus. It's just the same season all year. Now, the atmosphere is very dense carbon dioxide. It's 96.5% carbon dioxide. Now, that's what tra traps the heat, causes the greenhouse effect, which evaporated any water sources billions of years ago. Okay, now the next one is the Earth. Now you think, well, we don't need to know about that. Well, we know there are a couple of things that are interesting about the Earth. Uh, let's just see its relative size to the Moon first. As you can see, the Moon is quite small compared to the Earth. Now, the Earth as the third planet from the Sun. It's the largest of what we call the terrestrial planets, the rocky planets. Now, surprisingly, while it's only the fifth largest planet in terms of size and mass, it's the densest. That means it's got the most mass concentrated for its volume. Earth's not the only, it's the only planet in the solar system, so not named after a mythological being. Instead, its name is derived from the old English word, Erta, and the Anglo-Saxon word, Erda, which means ground or soil. So Earth means Earth. So Earth was formed somewhere around 4.54 billion years ago. It's currently the only known planet to support life and lots of it. Now the density of the Earth does differ in each part of the planet. So the core is the densest and then the crust is a lot less dense, but the average density is around 5.52 grams per cubic centimeter. Now the gravity between the Earth and the Moon is what causes the tides on Earth. Um, and basically what happens is the Moon draws the Earth towards it, the Earth draws the Moon towards it. The Earth's bigger so it wins, but the water on the Earth and uh, the oceans, as the Moon passes over, gets drawn up. And that's why we get a high tide and then a low tide as the Moon goes round. That causes the tide. And the Moon is... Um, locked it's tidally locked to the earth which means its rotation period is the same as its orbit so it always presents the same side of the moon to the earth um, that's why it's called the far side of the moon now the rotation of the earth is actually slowing down gradually the deceleration of the earth's rotation is very very slow it's slowing down by approximately 17 milliseconds every hundred years now eventually uh, this will lengthen our days, but it's going to take around 140 million years before our day will have increased from 24 to 25 hours. So Earth's atmosphere is composed of 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and trace amounts of other gases, including argon and carbon dioxide. It has a very powerful magnetic field, and it's this field that protects the planet from the effects of solar winds from the sun. And it's believed to be a result of the nickel iron core of the planet combined with its rapid rotation. And 70% of the Earth's surface is covered by water, and the remainder consists of continents and islands, which together have many lakes and other sources of water. The Earth has one of the most circular orbits of all of the planets. Its axis of rotation, that means it tilts slightly as it goes around the sun, is 23.4 degrees away from the perpendicular. Now that produces the seasons we experience, because as it goes around the sun, it maintains that angle. So whichever the south or the north is tilted towards the sun or away from the sun, that's what causes summer and winter. And then the transition as it goes around autumn and spring. So a year on Earth lasts just over 365 days. It's actually about a quarter of a day over, which is why we have to have an extra day every four years. Okay, Mars. This is the uh, planet that most people tend to uh, know most about. Uh, it's the fourth planet from the Sun, and it's the last of the terrestrial, the rocky planets. Like the rest of the solar system except Earth, Mars is named after a mythological figure, in this case, the Roman god of war. In addition to its official name, Mars is sometimes called the red planet because of the brownish red color of its surface. It's the second smallest planet in the solar system, just behind Mercury. There we go, that's what it looks like if it was standing next to the Earth. Now the land mass of Mars and Earth are very similar. Despite Mars being just 15% of the volume and 10% of the mass of Earth, it actually has a similar land mass because water covers about 70% of Earth's surface. Oops. Um, and the surface gravity of Mars is about 37% the gravity found on Earth. This means that on Mars, you could in theory jump three times higher than you could on Earth. 
So pieces of Mars have actually been found on Earth. It's believed that trace amounts of the Martian atmosphere were within meteorites that the planet ejected. These meteorites then orbited the solar system for millions of years amongst the other objects and solar debris before eventually entering the Earth's atmosphere and crashing into the ground. Now, the study of this material has allowed scientists to discover more about Mars before launching space missions. And Mars was once believed to be home to intelligent life. And this came from the discovery of lines or grooves in the surface called canali by Italian astronomer Giovanni Schiaparelli. Now he believed that these were not naturally occurring and were proof of intelligent life. However, these were later shown to be an optical illusion. Now Mars experiences huge dust storms, the largest in our solar system. And that's due to the elliptical shape of the planet's orbit around the sun very stretched out. The orbit path is more elongated than many of the other planets and this oval shaped orbit results in fierce dust storms that cover the entire planet and can last for many months. Now the Sun looks about about half the size it does from Earth when you look at it from Mars. So when Mars is closest to the Sun in its orbit and the southern hemisphere points towards the Sun and this causes a very short but fiercely hot summer. In the north, it experiences a brief but cold winter. When the planet is farthest from the sun, Mars experiences a long and mild summer because the, uh, the northern hemisphere points towards the sun. Now, this is compared with a cold and lengthy winter in the south. Strange seasons on Mars. So with the exception of Earth, Mars is the most hospitable to life. A number of space missions are planning for the next decade to further increase our understanding of Mars and when it has the potential for extraterrestrial life or not, as well as whether it may be a viable planet for a colony. Now it takes Mars 687 Earth days to orbit the Sun, with its orbit radius of 22, sorry, 227,840,000 kilometers. Mars is the only other planet besides Earth that has polar ice caps. Water ice has also been found under the Martian ice caps. So there's water on Mars. Now Mars has seasons like Earth, but they last twice as long. We said that because of the way it's tilted. So Mars could be somewhere where we could eventually settle down. It doesn't have a magnetic field though. And there are some scientists that believe it did once have a magnetic field somewhere around four billion years ago. Okay, so Jupiter. Jupiter is a beautiful looking planet. It looks like a certain sheet of marble or something it's lovely it's named after the roman king of the gods jupiter it's fitting of its name with a mass of 1.9 by 10 to the 27 kilograms and a mean diameter of 139,822 kilometers it's easily the largest the most massive planet in the solar system to put this into perspective it would take 11 earths lined up next to each other to stretch from one side of Jupiter to the other and then we can see it on the screen there the, the relative sizes of Earth and Jupiter. It would also take 317 Earths to equal the mass of Jupiter so we'd need 11 um, Earths across and 317 Earths to balance on a massive intergalactic scales. So when Galileo discovered the four moons of Jupiter in 1610, that was the very first proof of celestial bodies orbiting something other than the Earth. Till then, everyone thought everything went round the sun or even round the Earth. Um, and it was this that helped uh, discover the true nature of the solar system. It also provided, provided evidence for the Copernicus sun-centered solar system model itself. So Jupiter has the shortest day of the eight planets. The planet rotates very quickly, turning on its axis once every nine hours and 55 minutes. So just under a 10 hour day. Its rapid rotation is also what causes the flattening effect on the planet, which is why it has an oblate shape. It's like a squashed, more like a satsuma than it is an orange. So one orbit of the sun takes Jupiter 11.86 Earth years. So this means that when viewed from Earth, the planet appears to move very slowly in the sky. It takes months for Jupiter to move from one constellation to the next. Now Jupiter has at least 67 moons in satellite around the planet. That includes the four large moons called the Galilean moons that were first discovered by Galileo in 1610. The largest of Jupiter's moons, Ganymede, is the largest moon in the solar system. 
The moons are sometimes called the Jovian satellites and the largest of them, Ganymede, Callisto, Io and Europa. Ganymede is larger than the planet Mercury with a diameter of around 5,268 kilometers. Jupiter has a very strong magnetic field. It's around 14 times stronger than a magnetic field on Earth. It's the largest of any planet in the solar system. It's the fourth brightest object in the solar system after the Sun, the Moon and Venus. And Jupiter is the brightest and is one of the five planets which can be seen by naked eye from Earth. Jupiter's great red spot is an enormous storm. And that storm has been raging for over 300 years. The storm is so wide that three Earths would fit inside it. Okay, so Saturn, this is the one with the rings around it or the one that we think of with the rings around it. It's the sixth planet from the sun. It's the second largest planet of the solar system in terms of diameter and mass, second of the gas giants. It's easy to see why Saturn and Jupiter are being designated as relatives. From atmospheric composition to rotation, these two planets are extremely similar. And because of these factors, Saturn was named after the father of the god Jupiter, Roman mythology. Okay, that's relative size to the Earth. As you can see, it's gigantic. It's the um, last of the planets that was known to ancient civilizations. It was known to the Babylonians and Far Eastern observers. So Saturn is one of five planets able to be seen with the naked eye. It's also the fifth brightest object in the solar system. Now, the most common nickname for Saturn is the ringed planet, for obvious reasons. A nickname arising from those large, beautiful and extensive ring systems that encircle the planet. And these rings are made up mostly of chunks of ice and carbonaceous dust. And they stretch out for more than 12,700 kilometers from the planet. They're only about 20 meters thick. Now Saturn has 150 moons and smaller moonlets. And all of these moons are frozen, the largest of which are Titan and Rhea. Now the moon Enceladus also appears to have an ocean hidden below its frozen surface. And Saturn has been visited by four spacecraft, Pioneer 11, Voyagers 1 and 2, and the Cassini-Huygen mission. Cassini entered into orbit around Saturn on uh, July the 1st, 2004, and for many years continued to send back information about the planet, its ring, and many moons. So Saturn is known as a gas giant, but scientists believe it does have a solid rocky core surrounded by hydrogen and helium. Right, Uranus. Uranus rotates on its axis once every 17 hours and 14 minutes. Like Venus, it turns in a retrograde direction, the opposite way to Earth. Remember, sun rises in the west, sun sets in the east there. It takes Uranus 84 Earth days to orbit the sun, and its axis is at 98 degrees, which means it almost lies sideways as it orbits the sun. That means that the north and south poles of Uranus lie near where the equator is on Earth. Weird. So during parts of its orbit, one or other of the poles directly face the sun, which means the planet gets around 42 years of direct sunlight, followed by 42 years of darkness. So that's really weird as well, isn't it? You know, half, half 42 years in darkness, and then 42 years of direct sunlight. Strange. So a collision may have caused that unusual tilt. The theory is that something about the size of Earth collided with Uranus and forced its axis to drastically shift. Uranus also has rings. It has 13 presently known rings. And the matter within the rings is thought to be parts of a moon or moons that were shattered by high-speed impacts with an object such as a comet or an asteroid. Maybe the thing that took the um, planet on its side effectively also destroyed the moon. So Uranus is the coldest planet in the solar system. The minimum surface temperature on Uranus is minus 224 degrees centigrade. It's the coldest of the eight planets. Its upper atmosphere is covered with a haze made mostly of methane, which hides the storms taking place in its cloud decks. And then we have the last main full planet, Neptune. Now Neptune is the eighth planet from the sun and the last of the known planets. While it's the third largest planet with respect to mass, it's only the fourth largest in terms of diameter due to its blue coloration. Ne Neptune was named after the Roman god of the sea. It takes Neptune 164.8 Earth years to orbit the sun. So one Neptunian year is 165 of our years. So on July the 11th, 2011, Neptune completed its first full orbit since its discovery in 1846. Incredible. Neptune has the 
the second largest gravity of any planet in the solar system, second only to Jupiter. The orbit path of Neptune is approximately 30 astronomical units. It's 30 times away from the sun than the Earth is. This means it's around, um, yeah, 30 times the distance. So we could go to the sun and back 15 times will be the same distance as going to um, Neptune. The largest Neptunian moon, Triton, was discovered just 17 days after Neptune itself was discovered. And Neptune also has a storm similar to the Great Red Spot in Jupiter. It's commonly known as the Great Dark Spot, and it's roughly the size of Earth. Neptune, oh, I've just read that bit, oh, no, I've got that on twice for some reason. Neptune spins very quickly on its axis, and the planet equatorial clouds take 18 hours to complete one rotation. The reason this happens is that Neptune does not have a solid body, it's all gas. So the climate on Neptune is extremely active. In its upper atmosphere, large storms sweep across it and high-speed solar winds track around the planet at up to 1,340 kilometers per second. Now, the largest storm was in the Great Dark Spot in 1989, and it lasted for around five years. Like the other outer planets, Neptune possesses a ring system, though its rings are very faint. They're mostly made up of ice particles and grains of dust, the carbon-based substances coating them. So I said before, it's 14 known moons. Titan is the largest one, but it's frozen. Um, so that's Neptune for you. Oh, one last thing. Um, it's believed that Titan was caught by the immense gravitational pull of Neptune, which is regarded as one of the coldest worlds in our solar system. Average temperature on Neptune, minus 214 centigrade. And because I feel sorry for Pluto being demoted, let's have, find out a little bit about Pluto. Okay? Pluto is the uh, second closest dwarf planet to the sun. And from 1930, when it was discovered, until 2006, when it was relegated, it was also considered the ninth planet of the solar system. It's also the second largest dwarf planet, with Eris being the most massive known dwarf planet. Pluto was discovered on February the 18th, 1930, by a Clyde Tombaugh of the Lowell Observatory. In the 76 years between its discovery and subsequent reclassification as a dwarf planet, the planet completed just one third of its orbit around the sun. So since it was discovered, it hasn't even got all the way around the sun yet. The planet's named after Pluto, the Roman god of the underworld, um, and the name was proposed by an 11-year-old schoolgirl from Oxford by the name of Venetia Burney. It takes Pluto 246.04 Earth years to orbit the Sun. Pluto has five known moons. These are Charon, Styx, Nix, Kerberos and Hydra. It has 66% of the moon's diameter and just 18% of its mass. Sunlight on Pluto has the same intensity as moonlight on Earth. That's because it's so, so far away from the Sun in the outer, outer solar system approximately 5,945,900,000 kilometers away from the sun it's got an eccentric orbit it's inclined that means the orbit takes anywhere from 4.4 to 7.4 kilometers from the sun that should be millions of kilometers um, periodically pluto is actually closer to the sun occasionally than the eighth planet neptune it took sunlight over three hours to reach the New Horizons mission flying to Pluto. Some of the ashes of, the Clyde, of Clyde Tombo, the astronomer who discovered Pluto, are on board the New Horizons probe that went to Pluto and beyond. Uh, scientists believe that Pluto is made up of 50 to 70% rock and 30 to 50% ice by mass. It's expected to have a solid rocky core surrounded by water, ice mantle and a frozen nitrogen surface. That's cold. Pluto has an atmosphere sometimes. When Pluto's closer to the sun on its elliptical orbit path, the surface ice thaws and forms a thin atmosphere of nitrogen, methane, and carbon monoxide. As it travels away from the sun, this then freezes back into its solid state. <clears throat> I couldn't really leave the solar system, though, without looking at the sun, the source of all our power. So what is the sun? The sun is what we call a main sequence star. That means it's an average, run-of-the-mill star, just like most of the others that you see on a night sky. It just happens to be so near to us. It's composed primarily of two gases, hydrogen and helium. And that's the conditions um, 
met. The, the first condition is that it must have a mass falling within a certain range, which our sun has. Though debated, this range is generally accepted to be approximately 1.4 by 10 to the 29 kilograms, one, one with 29 noughts after it, and um, three by 10 to the 32. So it's three with 32 noughts after it. Its range is often described as at least 75 times the mass of Jupiter and no more than 150 times the mass of the Sun itself. The second and most important condition for it to be a star is that nuclear fusion must be present. We've already talked about this. Nuclear fusion being the process whereby two lighter atomic nuclei join or fuse together to produce a heavier atomic nucleus. In the context of stars, hydrogen is the lighter one, helium the heavier. So it's converting hydrogen to the helium, remember. Now the size of the Sun compared to other known stars, red giants, is not very big. However, if compared to most of the common type of star in the universe, the red dwarf, um, the sun is quite a bit larger. Thus, the sun is not the biggest type of star in the universe, but it's definitely larger than most. Now, as far as the sun's mass compared to other bodies found in our solar system, the sun is easily the most massive. The sun itself contains 99.8% of all of the mass of the whole solar system. In terms of size, the Sun has a diameter of roughly 1.4 million kilometers. That's 870,000 miles. And to put this into perspective, it's almost 110 times the diameter of the Earth. And what that means is that about 1 million Earths could fit inside the Sun. But the Sun accounts, as I say, for nearly 99, nearly 100% of the mass of the Earth, 99.86% of the mass of the solar system. And it has a mass of around 330,000 times that of Earth. It's three quarters hydrogen and the rest is helium, as we say. So over one million Earths could fit inside the sun. If you were to fit a hollow sun with spherical Earths, somewhere around 960,000 would fit inside. However, if you squashed these Earths to ensure there was no wasted space, you could fit 1,300,000 Earths inside the, um, inside the sun. The surface area of the sun is 11,990 times that of the Earth. So one day the sun will consume the earth. Yep, you heard that right. The sun will consume the earth. The sun will continue to burn for about 130 million years after it burns through all of its hydrogen. Instead, burning helium. During this time, it's going to expand to such a size that it will engulf Mercury, Venus and Earth. When it reaches this point, it will have become a red giant star. So the energy created by the sun's core is nuclear fusion. And this a huge amount of energy is produced when four new hydrogen nuclei are combined into one helium nucleus. The sun is almost a perfect sphere. Considering the sheer size of the sun, there's only a 10 kilometer difference in its polar and equatorial diameters. It's actually smoother than a, a, a billiard ball, if you were to scale it down. A billiard ball would have more lumps than the sun would. Um, it makes it the closest thing that we've got in nature to a, a, a perfect sphere. It's traveling at 220 kilometers every second. It's around 24,000 to 26,000 light years from galactic center. It takes the sun approximately 225 to 250 million years to complete one orbit around the center of the Milky Way. So when the sun was last in this part of the galaxy, dinosaurs were walking on the Earth. That's how long it takes to go around the center of the galaxy. So the sun will eventually be about the size of the Earth. Once the sun has completed its red giant phase, it's going to collapse. Its huge mass will retain, but it will have a volume similar to that on Earth. When that happens, it will be known as a white dwarf. Now, it takes a whole eight minutes for light to reach Earth from the sun. The average distance from the sun to the Earth is about 150 million kilometers. Light travels at 300,000 kilometers per second. So dividing one by the other gives you 500 seconds, about 8 minutes and 20 seconds. So if the sun was to suddenly go out, we wouldn't know about it until 8 minutes, 20 seconds later. And this energy can reach Earth in mere minutes, but it takes millions of years to travel from the sun's core to the surface. So the energy is released from the core of the sun, and it takes millions and millions of years to get to the surface of the sun, going all over the place, and then it comes out and it's hits the earth in, as we say, eight minutes and 20 seconds. Now the sun is halfway through its life. It's 4.5 billion years old and the sun has burned off around half of its hydrogen stores and has enough left to continue burning hydrogen for another 5 billion years. Currently the sun is a yellow dwarf star, as we say. 
that's a lot of information about the sum. So, is that it? Is that what we've got? Well, not quite, because we've done the sun, we've done the planets, we've done meteors, we've done meteor, we've done comets, we've done the asteroid belt, but there is a little bit more that we need to think about. We last week said that we wanted to know when we'd left the Earth. When did the Earth stop and space start? And we came up with the answer to that one and it's not that very far so this week the question is when does the solar system stop and when do we become into interstellar space which is the next thing that's our next part of the journey we're going to leave the solar system so the question is where does the solar system end okay well there is something just beyond the planets and it's called the Kuiper belt so far out past Neptune is a donut shaped collection of assorted rocks and frozen volatiles. That's gases that have gone to liquids and solids. And that circles the entire solar system. As I say, it's called the Kuiper belt. Now, the Kuiper belt, similar to the asteroid belt that's found between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter, but it is 20 times as wide and somewhere between 20 to 200 times more massive. The ices that are there are frozen gases, methane, nitrogen, ammonia, and water. And at least three dwarf planets are located in the Kuiper belt. Pluto, Haumea, and Makemeke. Also, some of the solar system's moons are thought to have originated there, such as Neptune's Triton and Saturn's Phoebe. Now, the belt is thick in most places and it's described as being more torus shaped. As I say, that's donut shaped than the belt would be. Now, the Kuiper belt contains millions of icy objects, ranging in size from small lumps of ice to large objects of 100 kilometers in diameter or more. And it's estimated that there are around 35,000 Kuiper belt objects that are larger than 100 kilometers in diameter. This is several hundred times the number of masses of objects found in the asteroid belt. So it's a massive band of what's left over from the, the dawn of the solar system. There may be as many as 100 million small and faint objects in the belt with a diameter of 20 kilometers or less. These findings by someone called Anita Cochran and a team of astronomers could not be confirmed by a follow-up Hubble Space Telescope observation though. Now, the largest object in the Kuiper belt is dwarf planet Pluto. Its status as part of the belt is what caused the planet to be reclassified as a dwarf planet in 2006. Eris is larger than Pluto, however. It is located in the scattered disk, although it was believed that it was originally found in the Kuiper belt. Neptune's moon Triton is also larger than Pluto. It's believed to have been captured from the Kuiper belt due to the gravitational encounters. The Kuiper belt is similar, as we say, to the asteroid belt, but it's much, much, much bigger. And that in itself is not quite the end of the story because there may be something a little bit further out, which is still possibly part of the solar system. So what is beyond the Kuiper belt? Well, it's something called the Oort cloud. Now, the Oort cloud is a cloud of gas and other bits and pieces that completely encircles everything else in the solar system. It's not just a disk or a donut shaped thing. It's actually a complete shield of stuff around the whole of the um, solar system. So it's where we find the final edge. But what exactly is it? What is the Oort cloud? Well, the Kuiper belt and scattered disks are less than one thousandth as far from the sun as the Oort cloud is. And it's believed that this could cloud of particles that are remains of the disk material which form the sun and the eight planets. It's the stuff that's left over from the beginning of the solar systems. And astronomers theorize that the matter at uh, comprising the Oort cloud formed close to the sun but was scattered out into space by the powerful gravity of the gas giant planet it's early in the uh, system's evolution. The Oort cloud is only loosely bound to the solar system it means it's easily affected by gravitational pull from passing stars and the Milky Way galaxy. In fact the outer limit of the Oort cloud defines the cosmological boundary between the solar system and the edges of the sun's gravitational dominance. 
So that is the end of the Oort cloud. Okay, so this week's little thing that you might want to do, if you so wish, is to um, build your own model of the solar system. So how could you do that? Well, if you wanted to do a scale model of it, you're in trouble because you haven't got a room big enough to do that. Uh, but you can build your own version. Uh, if you use an eight inch ball to represent the sun, then Earth will be about the size of a peppercorn. So we may want to just fiddle with that slightly to get different sizes. The dwarf planet Pluto will be the size of a pinhead. Not to mention the entire model would have a diameter of 1.58 miles. So we can build our own solar system by doing a few little things like this. So if you will need a cardboard box, some paints, maybe some glow in the dark paint, which is quite good, some assorted plastic foam balls, different sizes, uh, a poster board, some glue, some straws, some felt markers, and some fishing line. Here's how you do it. Get your cardboard box on its side so the opening faces you, so the top of the box facing towards you, and paint the inside black or a very, very, very dark blue. Add a few stars and galaxy with white paint, and this is where you can use your glow-in-the-dark paint for a better effect. Um, then you've got to sort your plastic foam balls out. So you sort them into sizes. The largest ball should be the uh, sun, obviously. Um, then you can have the next largest for Jupiter, then Saturn, then Uranus, Neptune, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and Pluto. So get your assorted various plastic balls of different sizes, maybe a ping pong ball, like an old tennis ball, a uh, golf ball, all the different things that can represent the planet. And then you can paint them. Because that's what you do next. You paint the, the yellow, the largest ball yellow for the sun. Mercury should be painted brown. Uh, Venus, Jupiter, and Saturn, brownish yellow, just mix it up a bit. Mars red, obviously. Um, Earth can be blue, blue greeny, Neptune and Uranus as well, and Pluto black. And then, this is the clever bit, you cut the planetary rings out on the asteroid belt, and you basically glue them into place, and you hang those balls with a bit of fishing wire from the top of the box. So you can cut and set your fishing line, you punch holes into the balls or you can tie the string around them and you hang them from the top of the box, glue it all in place <coughs> and let the paint dry and there you have it, a box with all the planets and make sure you get them in the right order of course and leave a little bit of space between Mars and Jupiter to hang your asteroid belt and now Pluto, as we know it's a dwarf planet so if you wanted to you could leave it out. Make sure you use an apron or old clothes. I don't want any angry parents moaning at me because they've had to uh, throw away some perfectly good clothes because they're covered in paints and glue. Um, and if you use tempera paints, they don't wash out completely. So uh, be prepared. Okay, right. So um, we now know all about the solar system, where it ends. We can now head off into interstellar space. And that's where we'll be going to next time. So join me next time uh, for, I'm just going to unmute everyone if they haven't anyway already. Join me next time. We're going to continue our journey across the universe. Um, in the meantime, I'm happy to take questions and answers, etc. But that was a lot of information to get across. I realize it was a lot of me talking. Yeah. But I yeah. think you'll, you'll, you'll find that the the planets are just amazing. And some of those temperatures and sizes and the sheer size of things are. But next week when we head out in to look at galaxies, well, stand by to think that the universe itself, compared with the, Milky, with, compared with the solar system, is even more massive and even more weirder. Okay, so the ro you know the rocket, the rocket experiment that we did? Yeah. Yeah, I did it. Did it work? Yep. Brilliant. Fantastic. It wasn't that high up, but it still works. Oh, well, there you go. Anybody else try the rocket? No. 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 Oh, you got to try the rocket. Who's uh, no. No? Uh, no, I wasn't allowed to. Uh, I don't think oh. I would have been allowed to. Oh. See if you're not allowed to. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Oh. No, good luck. Yeah, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible.
Chances are my baby sister would have destroyed it within five minutes. <laughs> yeah, baby sisters do that, don't they? They ruin stuff. Yeah. Right, I hope you enjoyed it this week, and I'd like to see you again yeah. next week. We're going to go out into the uh, interstellar space, and we're going to have a look at the galaxy um, and what that comprises, how many stars there are, how long it's been around, and everything like that. So there we go. I'll see you this uh, time next week. It's yep. safe, sir. Uh, cool. Yep, no worries. Thanks a lot, guys. Yeah.